This is from Instagram from a user mm -hmm. called Bent Viscal, and he wants to know who has been your favorite teammate so far? <laughs> well, not him, no jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the F1 Feeder Series podcast, your guide to keeping up to date on everything in the junior single-seater world. I'm your host, Jim Kimberley, and heute we have ein fantastischer Gast, a name that the Feeder Series world will all know, and someone who has amassed a lot of racing experience despite her young years, willkommen Sophia Flersch, wie geht's? Hello, thank you very much. I mean, your German was perfect. <laughs> oh, I don't think it was. My, my German was mediocre at best, I believe, but uh, I, I, I appreciate the kind words. How, how bad was that? No, it was actually really good. I was surprised when you switched to German. <laughs> I didn't expect that. <laughs> well, how about that? Oh, yeah. I'm, uh, I've done a little bit of German at school. I remember some bits and pieces, but I thought, no, let's try and be hospitable to our guests. So thank you for your... Uh, yeah, your lies lying through your teeth, but I, I try my best, I try my best. But joining Sophia is a familiar face to regular watchers and listeners after their great tales from the support paddock during the summer. And as if covering Formula 3 wasn't enough, today he's here to share his expertise on all of the Formula Regional and all of the Formula 4 action from Americas. Americas? The Americas. How is Michael McClure today? I'm doing well, thank you for asking. That was a great... Not really a weekend because the races were from Wednesday to Friday, um, but I had a great time in Texas at the Circuit of the Americas covering Formula Regional Americas and F4 US um, for their season finale. Definitely a good way to go out for the season um, and desperately excited to get back to another paddock, hopefully in a few months time in 2023. Yeah, it's uh, been a hell of a year for you and neighboring states. I'm in New Mexico at the moment, you're in Texas, but I, I when I saw Austin as well with the um, US GP, I was like, oh, I'll just have a little drive over there. Hours, but this country is big, so yeah, we were almost neighbors for a little while at least, Michael. But I'm glad you've had a good time, and I'm really looking forward to hearing everything about it. But before we get started, if you enjoy the podcast, please like, comment, and subscribe if you're watching on YouTube, or leave a rating or review if you're listening. You can leave a rating on Spotify and review us on Apple Podcasts. Thank you to everybody who does rate and review us, it really, really helps us out. Okay, let's start with, and I don't really know what to call it, I'm just going to put it all under 2022, because Sophia, I've asked all of our recent guests how their season has gone. It's a pretty broad question, but how has 2022 gone for you? Can you talk us through your year? I know you've done a little bit of everything but from everything <laughs> I've been researching before the podcast. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, 2022 was actually pretty cool for me. At least it started very good. Um, it was, um, yeah, starting with a podium in Le Castellet. I did ELMS this year um, with Algarve Pro Racing and the 24 hours of Le Mans. Um, and yeah, I mean, we had the first round in Le Castellet in Porica and we finished P2 on the first weekend. So it was a really good start into the into the year. Um, and then I was, you know, I was sharing the car with Ben Fiscal. Um, it was just us two drivers on the car, which was actually like we were the only car with just two drivers in, in LMS and P2. But um, yeah, we enjoyed it a lot. We had a really good pace throughout the whole year, actually, just some unlock involved. And then 24 hours of Le Mans came and well... I don't know where to start and where to end. We had a really good week. Um, we were really quick. I was sharing the car with John Falp. He was the amateur and Czech Aitken. So I'm um, a really good driver and experienced yeah. driver, actually. And, well, we just got really unlucky in the race in the end. But, um, yeah, a technical issue before the lights actually went green um, made us lose six laps in the end. So, um, yeah, I mean, looking back now, we would have won the category... Well, our class really easy but um yeah that's motorsport i guess but <laughs> from this everything's been good um to be honest yeah i, I know it. you've got i know you've got some exciting stuff coming up and i want to speak about that in a second but you just mentioned about bent viscal there i have this question from as19 which i was going to put in later but i think it's appropriate to ask it now they asked how much of a difference did it make to only have one teammate in the same car in elms compared to most teams that had three drivers so how 
much extra work? How difficult was it getting a setup? How how different did you find that? To be honest, um, I think it's easier in the end. I mean, you have a lot more, not a lot more, but you have more driving time because you're just two people sharing the car throughout free practice, but also in the race then itself, you know, um, you just have a lot more driving time, which obviously makes it easier for you because you get more confidence and more like of a feeling for the car. And then also with Ben, with ben in particular, for example, um, we always had a really similar opinion about car setup and car balance, which is always really helpful. In it's helpful indoor- of you two, because after speaking to Ben earlier in the season and knowing you, you two are opinionated people as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, but it, it kind of helped out that we were like on the same page, at least yeah. on the kind of same page. <laughs> and for, for car balance the whole season so um i mean if it's just two people kind of talking to the engineer what we want um it's a lot easier than three mm. people but um it was also the first time for me just having one teammate let's say in endurance um but but i preferred it um it's just really unusual i would say did you find then and i'm not gonna learn the financial route of it but did you find it actually better value in some ways that you actually drove for long because i know it's going to take effort and you know be physically demanding that you have to drive more but also you're a racing driver i presume you want to be in the car yeah i mean that's the thing in the end you know you're i mean as a driver you want to drive as much as possible and um with just two drivers being on the car i mean there's also like driving limits etc so or driving time limits so at some point um you just got to drive more and it's super cool in the end um i enjoyed it a lot at least i mean in, in either mess the, uh, the races are just four hours long so yeah, it would be different in WEC where you have just a lot more four time. hours. <laughs> yeah, just four hours. But um, no, it was it was a cool year. Yeah, yeah, I could imagine getting that much car time is it's one of the things we've spoken to some of the drivers about recently. Is in particular F two F three W series that the the car time just is so limited that you've had a real good stab at it. Yeah. Talk about the cars and what we're going to be doing going forwards. Okay. I saw some news that you're going to jump in a Formula One car uh in about two three weeks or so now so not not long how did that come about and how are you preparing for it's a brabham right yes um so i'm gonna be driving a formula one car historic i don't know if you hear it in the background but that's my dog actually drinking water right now (laughs) it's (laughs) an animal podcast it's a cat somewhere around here that's okay um Well, he's thirsty, but um, so yes, I'm going to drive a Formula One car actually in three weeks. So end of November in um, Dubai, it's a historic Formula One car. So the car is from 1992. It's a Brabham, as you said. And um, yeah, I mean, it's so cool. It's actually the first time for me that I'm driving a F1 car and then a historic one as well. Um, It's going to be at the Gulf Historic Grand Prix. And it's going to be so cool. I mean, the story kind of is that um, Giovanna Amati was driving the car in 1992 before Damon Hill actually drove the car for the second half of the I season. I was just Googling that. Was it the Damon yeah. Hill car? Because he made his debut in that one, I think, didn't he? Yeah. So yeah. Um, kind of that's kind of the story, you know. 30 years ago, a woman drove the car um, mm. and now I'm driving the car. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm I'm kind of freaking out. It's so cool. I cannot wait, to be honest. <laughs> yeah, it's... Uh... It's the sort of thing you dream about, right? Everyone wants to drive yeah. in Formula One if you're a racer, but driving a Formula One car isn't the, the same thing. And yeah, especially I think you're... the historic one. I mean, it's it's really special. And the car is like eight years older than me, but or like probably. <laughs> what's... No, don't yeah. stop. You're making me feel old now. I don't want to hear no. this. This is, this is four years younger than me, I think it is. Um, and just a quick thought about the season, about the, well, we're the F1 Feeder Series podcast and We've had the season with Formula 2, Formula 3, Frecker even as well. And I know that you have raced against some particular Formula 2 drivers. You raced against these guys. You've seen how they've done. How have you felt or have you, how much have you followed and how have you felt the season's gone? Drogovic now champion easily. We've got Victor Martin from Formula 3 as a champion. How have you enjoyed it? Yeah, well, I try to follow formulas in general as much as I can when I'm, um, let's say, not racing myself. You know, formulas are still, or like, say, the junior classes of formulas are still kind of um, yeah, the place I want to go back to at some point. Um, but yeah, it's as you said, it's it's kind of strange to see some guys in F2 now, even F1. I mean, Logan, you know, Logan Sargent was testing F1 and is maybe racing like F1 next year. And I raced with him in karting already. And we kind of 
grew up in the same paddock for for many many years so it's the same with mick as well though because you were karting yeah, around yeah, Mick's mick age, right? even longer actually yeah, yeah true um so yeah obviously it's kind of strange but um in the end you know trying to follow everything yeah huge respect to to Filipe Trugovic actually for winning the 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 season uh, championship I mean he's such a nice guy actually and also his whole family his mom it's it's I don't know it's really good old times which come up there but um yeah I mean that's kind of also still the place I want to go back to at some point yeah well, Michael you've been in the feeder series paddock did you meet Felipe's mom do you want to make this a Felipe Drogovic mom podcast you guys I know you mentioned the family <laughs> is why, why I bring this up you mentioned the family last time when we were on the podcast that you see all this stuff that you don't see from the fans perspective usually I did meet, uh, I think I met his dad briefly, but I've chatted with his mom a few times. She is super nice. Um, very, a little bit quiet, um, but but really, really like everything. Every time I talked to her, she was just always so proud of Felipe. And you can just tell that um, from her. I'm sure every parent is proud, but I think especially for her, that weekend in Monza was just really, really special after all the like sacrifices and stuff that they've made. Felipe going overseas away from them, especially mm -hmm. they live in Brazil, it's a completely different continent. So um, yeah, no, I have, I have met the family check you you're having such a good year i'm looking forward to hearing about some of the america stuff and if you are watching rather than listening that's the cat i was referring to earlier <laughs> so uh that will distract everybody from the next dance because i want to actually hear from you sophia about 2023 do you have any confirmed plans do you have anything that you can share with us what is what is the well post brabham post that off season <laughs> going to go down a little bit anything yeah. that you know you're doing for next year or is it still a little bit in flux well, it's nothing signed or confirmed yet, but um, the plan is for sure to stay in endurance next year again. I mean, I'm really happy actually that I stay silver. Um, so I'm going to be silver again, which is pretty important for myself, to be honest. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to do WEC next year. Um, we have some offers there on the table and now we just need to see what yeah, is the best one and what makes sense. But um I mean, the P2, to be honest, as I said before, you know, formulas is still my my ultimate goal. And as long as I don't have the budget, let's say, to do formulas again with a good team, I'm going to stay in endurance just because the LMP2 is so similar to formulas. And I think it's outside of formula racing, the best car to drive if you want to kind of stay in shape. Yeah, we had, uh, had Freddie Lubin on last week. He said it was just such a similar car in the end that it's yeah. still kind of like a, 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 sim, a single seater. That's fascinating. Yeah, I, I want to see, I want to have a flash forward into the future because I said it last week as well. You have these drivers that go into the like endurance sort of world and then don't get out of it because they enjoy it so much. And from the things you're saying, it sounds like you are enjoying it, although the single seaters is still, because you're 21 now, right? Yeah, I'm 21. So, so single seaters still can definitely be in the future, but I just yeah. wonder... How much of a difference is it? Well, I mean, to be honest, I enjoy endurance racing a lot. Um, the cars, as I said, they are really quick. The teams are so professional. It's incredible. Like the the guys, how, how many people actually pull up on a weekend and like the whole car, it's so technique and like all the, the sensors and the stuff you actually look into and the engineers, how many engineers you actually have and so on. It's it's really, really cool. And as you said before, you have so much more track time compared to junior classes and formulas. So for kind of the money you spend, let's say, you also get a lot. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm enjoying it. Driving wise, it's it's really similar compared to FIA 3. I mean, I never drove the F2 car, so I cannot really compare it. But um, let's say brake shape wise and arrow wise, it's it's really similar. Um, also, if you, I mean, with Ben who raced F2 last year, he was also saying like the jump actually from Formulas or F2 to to LMP2 is not that big. So, um, yeah, and you know, I mean, endurance racing is growing. I mean, with all the manufacturers coming back again in, in LMDH and Hypercar, it's it's an interesting platform to be on. And um, yeah, an interesting time to get into it. Just one final question for me on this point: the last time you drove a single seater was when and. How long has it been since you were in the single seaters? So um, the last time I raced single seaters was 2020 with the FIA3 um, uh -huh. with Campos together. Um, but you bra you, the Brabham doesn't go onto the onto the Wikipedia page is more what I'm asking. So when was the last time you were testing <laughs> yeah. one? No. So and the last time I actually tested a Formula Three car was two weeks ago in oh, Mugello. Wow. And how yeah, similar um, is it then? You so you're saying it's very similar. It still feels well, so similar. To be honest, that's a so I think the, the P2 car is really similar to the FIF3 car, mm -hmm. but I was testing the Euro Formula mm -hmm, F3 car, so the 
in my opinion, quicker one um, and the cooler one to drive, actually. And there is a bigger difference just because the car has so much more error and like the speed you can carry into corners is is a lot higher. Um, so that jump was a little bit bigger. But actually, those two test days were the first test day since 2020. So, um, yeah, you know, it's, good it's while. Been, been some time. Yeah. Let's switch focus from I say it's Europe, it's not, it's international, but generally it's European stuff we've got over there. But let's switch focus now to the US uh, and America's side of things. Michael, you are here to give us all the insight. So you mentioned you're in Texas for the finale. How was that? How has that differed from your fun times that you had in the summer going around the European paddocks? Well, I think what I'll start with is there's this little saying that's said in the U.S. called everything is bigger in Texas. And it truly is. I mean, beginning with the roads, which are massively wide, um, you can they're very wide and often very empty. So realistically, you can go as fast as you want down the roads. No comment on that. Um, <laughs> otherwise, uh, so another thing I should mention about this is when you're in Coda, you're in a very new facility. Um, it was built, I mean, 10, 11 years ago, hosted F1 in 2012. So the facilities are really up to date, especially compared to some of the European venues that are much more historic and haven't been updated. So you have this really modern media center that's quite large. The, the media center building itself has like a 500 seat area. And compared to the like F2, F3 media center, which fits about eight people, this is just a completely different world. So I could really just sit anywhere I want. Um, and I mean, all of it is just, it's very modern. It's very optimized for cars. So that's one thing that's quite different from, I think, Europe. And uh, Sophia, I'm sure you can probably attest to it. It's is definitely the infrastructure in a lot of places is quite old and outdated. Um, and as you're like wandering around, it can be pretty difficult sometimes to get around. So, so that was cool. But I mean, otherwise, it's one other thing I should mention that's so different is Europe is really competitive, I find. And sometimes very tense on the ground you get that tension too but there's always this kind of atmosphere of family that i think undergirds everything and especially that svra paddock svra is the like organization that oversees a lot of the historic racing and that's where formula regional americas and f4 us are they are the sport series to these historic cars and so mm -hmm. you get a very different culture there um you've got kids who are stepping up from quite literally a few lessons in skip barber and do some racing over the winter and they're in f4 us um, so it's very different from like someone that spent 10 years karting before that to to step into that. Um, you've got a lot more family run teams. You've got very involved parents, relatives who are just helping setting up the cars and stuff. So it's a very tight knit community, I'd say. And that that makes it pretty different. Um, also, having all the historic cars there. I mean, you walk out the pit lane and you see an, a GP2 car from 15 years ago. Um, or like these other historic indie cars or like historic sports cars from the 70s. And it's it's really just cool. You can walk down the pit lane and literally absorb what's happened in motorsport the past 50 years, which is so different from a lot of other, I think, single theater series that don't necessarily have that going on at the same time. So that's one thing that I really, really loved about about that experience. You get it everywhere. But I think especially being in at Coda, you see kind of how this old the older like cars and you see this new facility hmm. it's it's a very interesting mix um uh, it's like the opposite of europe we've got the new cars in the old venues, yeah the completely versa, different right? um and austin is a, a thriving city too it's burgeoning it's huge it's grown so much in the past like 20 30 years so um that's also it, it just overall it's it's not like anything else i really experienced um traveling around so i guess speaking about the series um we had one title battle that was pretty much a foregone conclusion in Formula Regional Americas. Raul Hyman, whom some of you may know from F3, European F3, FIA F3 even, um, he had to take a couple of years away from racing um, during COVID-19, simply just couldn't find a seat, um, struggled with travel restrictions, um, wanted to go to Japan. And now he's finally getting this chance. Um, he dominated the series. Um and he's going to get a scholarship um, from Formula Regional Americas to get a seat in a Honda-powered car. Um, Honda does give all the power units to these two series. So it's a great redemption story for him, someone who's really quite talented and has shown a lot, especially this year, um, just been a class above the rest of the field and hopefully now can get a chance to put his career back on track. Um, but uh, that title battle ended in strange fashion when Dylan Tavella, who is his, I guess, rival for most of the year, Hyman comes across the line first, and Tavella, with whom he battled all race, is about to come across the line second, spins it on the last corner, mm. and goes across the finish line in reverse. 
I do that in the Formula One games for fun sometimes. Yeah, well, this happened in real life. And he he kept second place because the car that was third hadn't yet made it across and later got penalized. So I have it on video. I think I might be the only one that got this on video um, because I was standing like right by uh, right by the the checker flag area. I was there. They credit to the series. They gave me tremendous access all weekend, letting me go right up to like literally by the start finish line to film the straight the the start and the finish so it's i have this thing on video and everybody was just shocked that this like actually happened his uh-huh. team boss didn't even know wow his team boss thought he crashed so tina larson who who runs crosslink kiwi um is there I'm, I'm seeing her in the podium she's like dylan's here didn't he crash <laughs> and i'm like no he made it across and i show her the video and she's just hmm. she's just shocked about it all so um that was that was quite a way to kick off the weekend. Um, the other two races are pretty demure in that in that series, but um, F four, as usual, is chaotic, um, especially when you've got some people that have like again ten years of karting experience, some people with a few rounds before F four US and in like a Lucas Oil series or a Skip Barber racing school, and you put them all on the same track. And I'm googling it now, Skip Barber lessons for the elderly, and I'm going to join yeah. that in F four next year. Um, I mean, <laughs> you probably could if you if you took enough classes, but um, so it's so that series is usually chaotic. This weekend, the standards were actually much better. VIR, which was the previous round, Virginia, yeah. it's a, a circuit that's got a lot of runoff, a very old old school circuit that was full of crashes. They had to give half points for two of the races just because there were so few green flag laps. So but that's so a four style. Yeah, that's, know, that's what when you watch it, you want safety cars. That's why people watch a feeder series, right? It's classic F4. It was uh, that got it was my birthday weekend and that got me up in the morning just seeing them going out and like they had to a, a, like a meeting with the race directors because the standards were so so shoddy that weekend. But this weekend it, everyone commented it was a big improvement. Just the track really suited the cars better, I think. And so you had some great racing. You had some uh negotiations in the stewards room between uh the top two title protagonists, so Lockie Hughes and Bryson Morris. Um Hughes is from Australia, took two years off again with COVID, came to the U.S. this year, ultimately was crowned champion. Um, Morris was able to race and has been in F4 U.S. last year as well. The title was decided around 9.30 p.m. on Saturday. Um, I was in a parking lot about to leave. Uh, And Lockie Hughes, who won the title because of two penalties given to Bryson Morris, was in the bathroom when he found out. (laughs) (laughs) What? So yeah, just, sorry, just to me, clarify here, because the Americans like to say bathroom when they mean toilet. You are referring to the European toilet the, when you say bathroom, toilet, right? Yes, yeah. yes, he was in the toilet. <laughs> uh, apparently, he was he was there, and uh, so he ran down to team boss Jay Howard racing in the car back in the day after washing his hands. Yeah, it ran down to the. I, I don't know the details of what it was. I never asked, but ran down to Jay's hotel room, and that was how they were celebrating. Was in their like hotel away from the racetrack. So, if we're talking about strange championship endings, we've got F one Max Verstappen finding out in a post race interview. We've got Drogovic on the pit wall. We've got Martens on the pit wall. We've got W series just straight up canceled. Um, and now we have one driver who wins as his rival goes backwards across the line, and the other one wins. While in his hotel, being on the toilet. <laughs> yeah, on the toilet. So every series I've covered has had some sort of just completely insane ending. Um, well, thank you so much, Michael Massey, for starting this off last last <laughs> year because this has been terrific to watch these fantastic finales. Sorry, Michael, I interrupted. Yeah, you. I mean, it's a good thing we weren't watching that last F four US one, um, but. It was it was definitely weird. And and I mean the Sunday race, obviously some pressure was off, so they were able to go full out. And I mean, really, it was great racing. The it was a shame though that they weren't like broadcasting it live. So F1 Feeder Series America is on Twitter. We were posting stuff. I was posting live updates on my personal Twitter just from what I could see on the start finish straight. Um I caught a couple races up from the Coda Tower. Yeah. This, was, this is with the, this is like what 70 view. foot high or something, right? It's 200 something oh. feet high, 250 or something like that. Yeah, so now, 70, 250, it's the same. Yes, 39 flights of stairs, um, no elevator. So <laughs> it was a good workout. And I really liked it up there, except for the glass floor. Because you look down and you see turn 16, 17, 18. That was a little bit too much for me. Um, so I got a couple of videos for the fans. Probably won't go up there when I started to feel it shaking a little bit. So. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sophia, have you been to America? Is it something you'd consider? Because I know, well, uh, 
inevitably Jamie Chadwick was going to get brought up and I know Jamie Chadwick is now looking at indie lights as an option because of funding issues which you were also mentioning the struggle is that something you've considered as well well um well obviously I mean America is is a really good option and a really good place to go I think um in formulas but also like with indie lights indie car but also IMSA with with endurance racing you know um but well and so now I didn't I didn't make it um what like I didn't do it let's say, yeah. let's say like that um right now I'm pretty happy with Europe um I was trying to get a seat or trying to figure out um to do 24 hours of Daytona end of mm. January but well I think it's kind of an indecision. Well, it's going to happen next two weeks or it's not going to happen. We'll see. Um, but yeah, I've been to America sometime to go testing, but um, not to race, at least in cars. What testing? What, what car were you testing at the time? Uh, actually, beginning of this year, we were testing with APR in Sebring and in Homestead. Oh, wow. So are you... So with a P2. Were you... Were you yeah, but were you um, tempted at all to, to make the jump? Or are you just thinking if you want to make that step to Formula One, you have to stay in Europe? Well, I think to be honest, I mean, well, I think obviously I think the junior classes in Europe like F3, F2 are it's easier to get to F1 if you if you're good in them. Um I mean IndyCar for sure in America it's a good place to to let's say start your proper career or like earn money, but mm. I think you then stay there just because the fans and like it's a big big family i mean i just see it always on tv and and it's incredible america is is so different to europe in my opinion um but i think you're just kind of stuck there then i mean i was always caught talking to Catherine letch who was racing in europe as well and then she went to america and she never came back really just because she loved it so much um so yeah, we'll see. You know, I, as I said, America is always an option. Also, Japan mm-hmm. is really interesting. Um, but until now, oh, yeah, until now, I'm just going to focus on Europe. Of course. Michael, final thing just on this stuff in America is because there's some news that came out in uh, interesting timing on the, the run up to the Brazilian Grand Prix. Is it the Sao Paulo Grand Prix these days? But the Brazilian F4 will support F1 from next year, I believe it is. Uh, what, what news do you have of, on this? Yeah, so uh, actually our Brazilian F4 editor, Maria Clara Castro, broke the news um, on Saturday that we would be getting the Brazilian F4 would be racing as a support series to F1 next year in Interlagos, which is great news for all those those drivers there that will get a chance to show their skills on the big stage. And I think this just gets into something that's been a trend the past probably five, six, even maybe more years in F4 of Teams and drivers are really aiming for the F4 series that will put them on the circuits where F1 also races um, and in front of those bigger stages. So it's obviously not common that F4 will race alongside F1. In fact, I think except in the Americas and in any other like non-European part, it's, it, that's really only where you'd see it. Um, F4 US and Americas used to race in um, at Coda alongside F1, not this weekend. Thank God, because that would have made the traffic a lot worse. <laughs> so I'm grateful for that. But I'm sure the drivers would have wanted that. But in, in general, just having that experience is so good because you, especially for the ones that do have the talent, the ability, the backing, whatever, to make it to F1, you get that experience of those circuits early and you just get more practice on them. So if you look at why, let's say, Italian F4 has been so popular recently, it's because they've got circuits that are on the F1 calendar. They've got Monza, they've got Imola, they've got Red Bull Ring. Um, they're going around to places that you're you might be racing on, even in, you know, Freca F3, F2, anywhere you go up, you have that. And ADAC F4 in, in Germany, I think, has has struggled a lot with this because Germany doesn't have an F1 race. Um Sophia, I'm sure you probably have thoughts on this, but it's it's uh it's just less lucrative, I think, for that reason, because you don't get that much experience on F1 style tracks. A lot of the other regional um, F4 series, same thing, British F4 is another example. We've got one British Grand Prix, other, all the other circuits there, if they're supporting um, like domestic racing series in the UK, you're only gonna get one shot on Silverstone, maybe two shots if you've got different configurations and you're you're not getting that exposure otherwise and you're racing on circuits that, well, if you go into touring cars, it might be useful or GTs, but not really in single seaters. Yeah. So. It is a trend that's happened, and I think especially for these drivers, just getting, you're obviously still going to be racing on Interlagos in Brazilian F4, you're still going to be racing on Coda at USF4, but getting it on that weekend is really a big boon for those drivers, especially, you know, you do it on a huge audience, you get that extra pressure, you get that extra attention, and you also get a lot of marketing and sponsorship 
um, extra eyeballs that are there that can really help you in your career. So it's for sure a big step for that. And piggybacking off of where we see, you know, Drogovic has had this great success in F2. Um, I get the sense there's a lot of momentum building. Brazilians want an F1 driver. It's been years. Drogovic is doing well. Fittipaldi has done well. Um, and now you really, really want um, someone who can be in that series full time. Um, so it's a, it's another chance for maybe someone who, you know, 2023, they win that support series and maybe 2029, they're in F2 on the brink of F1. So um, it's definitely, we won't see the effects of this for a while, but I think it, it's a good step for sure for all those drivers. You bring up really good points there and you see like the likes of, was it Hajar and Monaco when you're on the F1 weekend and all of a sudden your life can change if you do impress. So uh, fascinating. I do want to ask a question and I've got loads of questions for the audience. So they'll be screaming at me, but you mentioned that German thing there and it's something I hadn't realized that Sophia, what's going on at the moment? So Mick might be out, but Hulkenberg might be in. So there might still be a German driver. But going down the order at the moment, it does seem quite quiet. Like somebody was saying Tim Tramnitz might be the closest that Germany's got to a to an F1 driver at the moment. Do you know, do you I think this is what might be? No, well, do you, no, do, do, this is the point. It's, it's down in, in Frecker, but there, there is that gap at the moment between Mick and then Tim that it's gone quiet. Is is that just a the Vettel era ending and now we're seeing the, the hangover of it? No, well, I do think that it's a kind of a funding problem we have in Germany, you know? Um, I mean, I was racing with Beckman, with David Beckman and Dirim Tindili as well since karting, actually, and they've mm -hmm. also made it up to F2, but then they had to stop just because of funding issues. And it's similar to me. I mean, I never made it to F2 because I never had the budget for F2. But, um, you know, in Germany, you don't have let's say big sponsors or let's say the federation who is really supporting drivers as Michael just said with Brazilian or like Brazil trying yeah. to support young drivers and give them opportunities to actually have a Brazilian F1 driver again. That's not really happening in Germany and um, it's not been happening the past years. And that's actually really sad because looking back, I remember when I was really young and we had the times where we were seven drivers, seven German F1 drivers actually. I remember before. because I had to watch Button lose all the time. Yeah. And <laughs> yeah, but that's, I mean, that's not so long ago. And now we, I mean, Fettel is, is, is ending his career in F1. And yeah, maybe we just have one more, or maybe we just have one German driver next year, actually. And, you know, in Germany, we are normally the country with like all the, or, not all the, but many manufacturers and so on. So it's really sad to see. Um, and I really hope that at some point um, some people open their eyes and actually see that there needs to change something for, like, let's say, the young generation. Because in the end, it's just a funding issue. I mean, the budgets you need in formula classes in junior in in, in junior classes and formulas is just incredible. And um, yeah, it's 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 getting more expensive year by year, to be honest. <laughs> Right, that's enough questions from me because the F1 Feeder Series podcast is for you, viewers and listeners. We're going to move on to the hashtag AskF1FS part of the podcast. If this is your first time watching or listening, you can get involved by using the hashtag AskF1FS on Twitter, joining our Discord and using the podcast questions channel, commenting on our YouTube videos or keeping an eye out on our Instagram posts and stories. Loads of questions, probably some of the most... <laughs> Uh, most about questions I think we've had for a single driver. So Sophia, I think, how many followers have you got by the way now? It's like half a million on Instagram, 100,000 on Twitter. You're a popular, yeah. popular driver. So uh, I think, yeah, well, overall channels probably more than a million. Yeah, that's a lot. So thank you for coming on the podcast and bringing all this attention because you've got so many questions. Let's start with this one. This is from Instagram from a user mm -hmm. called Bent Viscal. And he wants to know, who has been your favorite teammate so far? <laughs> well, not him, no jokes. <laughs> 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 jokes, I mean, <laughs> come on. Um, well, to be honest, I think it's difficult to say your favorite teammate. I mean, in the end, you know, um, yeah, you have good seasons, you have not so good seasons. Um, but to be honest, I always got along with everyone. Um, I mean, 
yeah, the past two years I was in an all female team, let's say, with Tatiana and Baiske, and we are good friends. But also with Ben this year, it was a lot of fun. And um, well, Adachi is still really similar to German, and he was playing German music the whole time when we had lunch. Like he knew songs like Schlager, I don't know, which I didn't even know, but he was singing along like perfectly in German. So um, no, um, to be honest, I mean, yeah. I never really had someone I didn't like. So yeah, with Ben, it was, it was funny this year. So I would, because he asked it, I'm going to say Ben. <laughs> yeah, you've had to go down the political route, but it sounds like if you want to get on Sophia's good side, just start learning German to sing songs and then she'll be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> For this next question, I'm just going to cut here to, well, but let's see who it is. I remember um, when I saw her in, um, when was it, in, in, the European Le Mans series, I saw her and I was like, oh, long ago. And then she said that she was filming a TikTok. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to ask her, <laughs> which TikTok was it and how was it? From Marta Garcia, do you remember this at all? Oh my gosh. I, well, I, I know that I saw her because we talked. Um, and I remember that she actually saw me filming a TikTok, but I, yeah, I think it was like a transition video. And I think I uploaded it like some days ago on my Instagram channel and it went quite good. I think it was that one actually. So but, is this um, like you updated it like recently, I mean, a few days ago now or updated it? Yeah. Cause yeah. Cause you know, I mean, if you, if you do Instagram, like in a good way, you post frequently and then you get half like, a million race, followers. Yes, you know, and then like when I always when I have race weekends, I have like a content creator with me and we produce some stuff already in advance, you know, so I used that reel, I think, some days ago. It was like a transition video. How about that for timing then? I'm just, like I said earlier, I'm ancient here. TikTok isn't my thing. I know Robert Schwartzman was huge on the TikTok side of things as well. Is it one of those transition videos as it's like you jump from place to place? Yeah, similar. I mean, I was just moving my leg and then I changed outfits. I see. But you know, nowadays, nowadays you can use TikToks also on Instagram. So it's like actually the same way so, of filming stuff. Oh, you got all the social media stuff down to a T. There you go, Marta. I know you were, she was genuinely interested in knowing that. So now <laughs> the answer has been found. Michael, do you want to ask this next question for us? For sure, yeah. So this one is from uh, Theo via Discord. Um, earlier in the year, you got second at Paul Ricard, nearly nabbing the overall win. What do you as a driver see in yourself that could make you and your team better and get you over the hump to finally taste victory? Well, I mean, especially endurance racing is kind of a, let's say, many people, many things and many, yeah, people have just have to be 100% there on a, on a weekend or on a race, actually. I mean, in Pari Car, we were... I mean, we did a great job, but we were also really lucky strategy wise. And to be honest, um, in endurance, especially strategy is everything kind of, I mean, like full course yellow and safety cars, they just like, I mean, they can screw you a lot. Um, so it's just, everything kind of needs to fall into place. And um, I mean, that day we, we, we finished second and yeah, we were actually not that far away from P1 looking at where we started. So yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, I really hope that at some point, maybe next year, there will be a win um, coming in. But, you know, it's kind of those, those I don't know, weekends where you're like, you're not expecting anything. Because also in Paul Ricard, we started P10, I think. And for us, it was the goal to finish on the podium, but kind of P5 or so was realistic. And we finished P2, you know, it's just those days where you don't expect it. And then it's just everything falls into place and everyone in the team um, is, is doing a good job and um, that's kind of what happened in, in Lucas Silly. Are you thinking at the moment that there's anything you can do personally is it just getting more track time that makes you get quicker because it's, it's saying here like about oh. the team you is it just yeah. you getting more experience with the car? Well, I mean, to be honest, uh, the more track time, the better it is. I mean, if 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 I can be in a race car every single day, I would do it. Um, sure. But um, I, th I think that's what everyone <laughs> would answer. And it's just it's just a fact. Um, but I mean, in the end, you know, um, the more you can test, the better it is, the more you can race, especially the better it is um, for sure. I mean, yeah, there's always stuff you can still improve and work on. And that's the same for me, obviously. Um, so we'll see, you know, next year, it's going to be my fourth year in endurance racing, actually. Um, hopefully in, in, in WEC again. So, yeah, it's it's 
obviously I'm going to try my best and, and see um, that I help as much as I can to get that victory. <laughs> A very driver PR answer, but I understand what you're saying. This question is from Ron Robert Zigwita via Twitter. What's been the biggest lesson within your DTM stint? And is break by wire still a competitive disadvantage? Uh, it's actually steer by wire. Um, but um, so DTM was... I need to say, I mean, as a German driver, DTM was super cool, um, you know, to be on German ground again, like with German fans and I don't know. It should... German music. German music, obviously. <laughs> no, it, was, it was just a really cool vibe. Um, I mean, for me, to be honest, on the sporting side, it was difficult as well because it was GT3s, which is different compared to what I was used to, you know, with ABS and just a lot. It was really heavy and you don't have any power for that weight, to be honest. Um, it was it was different, but towards the end of the season, especially, um, it got better and better. And also I kind of I understood how the car works. You know, we kind of changed um into a normal steering system again. So um, which also gave me more confidence and to feel the car more. Um, I mean, you also saw it actually this year in DTM. It's just a super close championship, which is kind of dedicated like. BOP is kind of the most important thing in that championship. Um, and yeah, I mean, to be honest with Steer by Wire, coming back to this, um, I was really happy to drive it for half a year because I had Scheffler as my, my main partner, to be honest. Um, but in the end, I mean, we proved that that steering system is working for racetrack as well and for DTM as well, which was really like high level that year. But for the last one or two tenths, it was just or one, two, three tenths, it was just not there yet. And um, to be honest, I mean, we wanted to prove that it's working on a racetrack. And I think we did that. And then that's also kind of what that was also the reason by halfway through the season, we decided to put the normal steering back in again, just because um, it was it was already proven that it works, to be honest. And so you picked the points up as well. So you were getting those extra tenths that you mentioned. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Or, uh next question is from tom evans photos michael if you could take that one yeah so tom evans their british f4 editor um and he would like to know the crash involving you at the 2018 macau grand prix was a huge talking point for many reasons the main one being safety do you think that safety advancements in motorsport and more specifically in single seaters have been enough in recent years well um to be honest I do think that the FIA is doing a really good job. Um, I mean, the cars got updated you know, not year by year, but like every single year, like in steps that say, you know, the FIA is really thinking also after my crash, I was in contact with many of those people um, for many times actually to talk about the crash itself, but also about like safety, which what they can change, um, what is already good and so on, because I also had some questions. Um, and, you know, I think it does take time. Looking back now, the past years, I think many things changed. They for sure, I mean, the whole sport for sure got a lot more safer. But in the end, you know, everyone knows that we are racing with like really high speeds there. And especially in formulas, um, you know, as a driver, that something can happen. Um, but I mean, also, you know, my crash, it happened with 280 and I'm still here being able to do my or to work and to go racing and so on. I mean, if this crash happens or if you have a crash with 280 in a normal road car, I don't think that I would sit here, you know? So I think you always kind of have to, um, yeah, compare it. And um, for that, the FIA is doing a great job. Also in endurance racing, um, it's, it's really good to see how they kind of involve drivers and ask and, and try to get also our opinions about some stuff. Can I ask a question which wasn't asked, and sorry, listeners, but I think it's a question which is asked a lot, in particular after Silverstone this year. You've raced GT, you've raced endurance, you've raced single-seaters, sausage curbs from a safety perspective with single-seaters, and but you, you know the reason why they're there for the GT racing, right? Is that something that is still, because that's my big thing at the moment, that is still something that FAA could improve, in particular on the, on the single-seater route with getting rid of sausage curbs? Well, I need to say my 
particular case in Macau, it kind of saved my life because they made me fly. Um, <laughs> and otherwise I would have ended up in a, the driver and then in the wall. So I think in my particular case, it was actually good that they were there. But um, um, yes, I do think sausage curbs could be changed or at least, I mean, rapper ring, to be honest, is a really good example with you have some curbs, you know, where you just you have the curbs and then you have like, yeah, the curbs, which are just different shape, but everyone knows what the track limits is and like that you just cannot go over it. Sausage curbs at some in some corners and some tracks are just still wrong, wrongly placed. You know, also for example, um Alex Peroni's crash in Monzo um with the F3 was was crazy, and that was just because of sausage curbs as well. So um yeah, I do think and I agree on that point that sausage curbs um still yeah, need some improvement. That's fair enough, and I'm I'm actually very impressed that you answered the question because it's very contentious at the moment. Something which uh, I'm sure you get asked a lot from Wes Mansbridge here. If you could give career advice to a young female racing driver, what would you say? And can I also put a caveat on would it be different from what you'd give to a male racing driver? Um, well, I would say. To be honest, for female, I would say just really uh, believe in yourself and um, don't let other people um, bring you down or so. I mean, um, you know, yes, for sure, let's say the female picture changed a lot during the last years. I mean, back in the times when Michel Mouton raced or in law, for sure, it was a whole different world and a lot harder. So it did improve, yes, but still there's here and there people not really wanting females or girls inside of motorsport, um, inside in karting, but also inside of, of car racing, let's say. So I would say really just believe in yourself and keep on going and try, try to keep on going like every single year, even if it's maybe a championship or something you don't really want to do just keep on driving because um, I think track time and driving time is most important, especially when you're young. Um, so yeah, that's probably what I would say to a yeah, young girl. And um, yeah, probably similar to a guy as well. I mean, for sure, the self-confidence and like people telling him directly in the face to stop it because he's a man is not going to happen. That's huh. more <laughs> for, for women, but yeah, um, yeah, I mean, in the end, it's just always about keep on go- keeping, keep on going, and um, to to stay on track. Do you find it weird that you're 21 and are seen as like a role model to people who are wanting to to reach it because you're still at such a young age? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I mean, you know, also lot like still, I have. I it's kind of good to see to be honest I mean young girls coming up to me even if like some of them are like six seven years old some of them are like 18 19 and it's it's so nice to see and like them coming up to me and asking like how they can get involved with motorsport as a racing driver but also in different areas and so on and uh, I mean yeah best example last year in DTM when they really came up to me and they started crying just because they saw me and I was like stop crying because I'm gonna cry as well um no it, it's 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 so good to see and um that's also kind of why I'm doing a social media to be honest in the end because I want to show the world and not just like motorsport fans but in general people that you can do motorsport and racing even with like long blonde hair and like pink nails and so on like you don't have to change you can be yourself um also as a woman and still race quick cars um in circles so um in yeah circles. I don't be... stop stop yeah. that we don't we don't want to encourage that <laughs> no, but that's kind of you know how people see it yeah. but in the end you know I, I i don't see myself as a role model i am more see myself as a big sister showing them what they can do in life that's a lovely quote we're gonna get that put onto instagram <laughs> aren't we yeah absolutely well i want to shift the focus a bit away potentially from single seaters and Open it up to a question from Martin Spearings, who wants to know, what racing categories are you open to ever driving? IMSA, Formula E, Rallycross, Extreme E, or will we even see an attempt at IndyCar? Well, um, to be honest, I would, yeah, stay like on, on um, yeah, Formulas, IMSA, all those kind of things. I don't think Rallycross or Extreme E is my kind of... Um, area to be on to be honest um i kind of yeah i mean i grew up in karting and then formulas and a normal let's say tarmac 
streets. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, I'm I'm pretty open there to be honest. Um, as I said, the goal is still to get back to formulas, but if that's not happening because of uh, budget reasons, then I'm gonna focus on endurance racing. And then you have um, WEC LMS, you have IMSA. Um, yeah, and I'm I'm obviously going to try to keep on doing that sport as long as possible. So maybe even at some point GT3 racing when I'm older. But for now, I'm going to skip that ABS part and stay on like <laughs> normal, normal breakings. I tell you what, the time to get into WEC is right now with some of the stuff on the horizon. So you're at such a good point with the amount of attention that championship is about to get, even though it's grown in its presence. Yeah, it's a really good time. There's a next question from Alex Stanger. And it's something that I actually thought of recently on a different side of things, just considering all the drivers going back in Formula One from Americas to Europe and then coming back to Brazil and then going to Abu Dhabi. Do you feel homesick when you're abroad for several weeks at a time? Um, well, this year was okay, actually, because I just did one championship. But last year, for example, when I did WEC, actually, and DTM, it was it was crazy at some point. Like I, I remember I was like gone for eight weeks. And just like from one track to the other and then from one meeting and event to the other. And yeah, I think I was sick and like ill for like three times during that eight weeks. But Flying um, does that, right? Yeah, I mean, that's just, you know, that's traveling and waking up in the morning, not knowing where you are and what you're going to do on that day. But um, I mean, I'm still young and um, I'm enjoying it. You know, it's kind of part of the job and... Yeah, as long as you're on racetracks with with like motorsport people talking motor stuff, motorsport stuff, it's it's fun. And obviously, there's also days when you're like exhausted and sick and ill, but still, um, you're doing it. I mean, yeah, last year Bahrain, the WEC final, I was I was really dead. I had like forty degrees f- fever, fever, and my ears were closed and everything. I was done, but I still raced the eight hours race, and um, it was good fun. In, in the end, looking back now, it was it was good, and I enjoyed it even with being completely sick. <laughs> so you're looking forward to the off-season for a little bit more home time. I know, last, this, this year's well, last is quite different. Yeah, you know, I mean... Do you, get, I do you get bored? Well, I love Christmas and New Year's, but after two weeks being home, yeah, I don't have anything to do anymore, so it's good to be <laughs> travelling again. I mean, um, yeah, I love home, obviously. I love being with my family and friends, but, um, yeah, travelling was always... I kind of grew up with travelling, with karting and so on, so it's 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 part of the game. There's a question from Felix, which I asked for a clarification, not so sure. And I believe, well, the question is, why are you so critic resistant? And I believe you tried to ask why you're so resistant to criticism. And you do seem maybe listening to your own advice when you said younger, just like keep going. Is that just because of you faced that sort of criticism through your career? Well, to be honest, I mean, I always say, you know, people don't need to like me and for sure I, I mean also Lewis Hamilton or Max Verstappen there's people loving him and there's or them and there's people not liking them I think that's normal um but I just don't like if people say their opinion without knowing how racing world works you know people not knowing what budget you need and that it all comes down to money in the end and that's like some of the drivers spend already like half a million just for winter testing and um that just really annoys me you know and that's like kind of when i'm like "Hmm." (laughs) don't tell me now um how motorsport works and expect me to like your comment and so on so um yeah that's just um yeah my opinion (laughs) uh michael the next question ties into this nicely if you could uh follow up on this yeah well it's about um Karina Hills lady on Twitter has said you have really strong opinions and are not afraid to tell them, which personally finds very admirable. Do you feel that this might have hurt you in your career so far? I don't know, to be honest, but um, it might have hurt me. I have no idea, to be honest, but to be honest, I'm I'm, I'm an honest person and I don't want to, yeah, be just happy and like, I don't know, don't say the truth or like hide stuff just because the truth might hurt some people or might look, might not look good. Cause in the end, you know, I do think that many things in motorsport are still not going right. And many people don't really talk about how it really works and how much budget you really need and how just the whole motorsport world actually works. And everyone in motorsport knows it, but no, not many people actually talk about it. 
So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, everything I'm saying is, 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 is honest and it's just how I experienced it at least or how I feel it works. I mean, there might be people thinking that it works different, fair enough, but that's at least how I realized it over the past 17 years. So um, yeah, that's just kind of how I grew up with to always be honest and tell what you think. And um, yeah, that's kind of what I'm doing. Do you think that in recent times, because we talk about budget all the time, but we're, if you're following feeder series to the level that we are, we're pretty damn dirty. But do you feel that it has been something that's been discussed more as you've gotten older with like the, the advent of Twitter, internet, everyone be able to communicate a bit more? Because we've had the conversations on the podcast and Jamie herself, when she was on, said, I couldn't afford a seat in F3. Like I couldn't afford a yeah. good seat, let alone a mediocre one. Yeah. Do you think that's something that people are more aware of as you've got older? Yes, I've, I, I mean, people are talking about it and um, that's also the right thing to talk about it, you know, because in the end, if you don't have it from your own pocket or your parents don't have it, then you need sponsors and partners and those people, because it's big numbers about which you're talking, that they also need to understand it and they also, you know, they need to read it also in the media. So it's good that people talk about it and say it and um, that also drivers talk about it because it's incredible. Like, I mean... I remember 2018 when I um, did my first year in in, in Formula Three, which ex- which was actually racing with DTM back in the times. I remember I was like on a training camp with some of the DTM Mercedes drivers, and I was talking to Danny Junkadea, and it was so strange because he asked me like what I'm like what the budget for that season was, and normally the budget was around one to one point two million, but I paid like, I think seven hundred or so. And um, he was, like I said, 700. And he was like, what? He paid 350,000, like, I don't know, five, six, seven years earlier with one of the best teams. And it's crazy how the budgets got higher and they still get higher year by year, you know, but (laughs) you need that money. And um, yeah, also Jamie, I mean, for sure, she can probably afford a seat for one year, but it's probably not going to be with the best team. And then what's happening afterwards? Because I mean, you still, it's, it's the same for me, you know, I can do one year of F3, yes, but what does it, like, F2, I for sure cannot afford, because there you need more than 2 million, so, um, yeah, other people buy houses from that. <laughs> That's such a good point, in your <laughs> age. It's, 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 I mean, it's, it is true, it's, it's, that's the level of, of finance we're dealing with. I, the podcast is a very small world, uh, bit in a very small world, but I'm trying to, you know, shine a light on the ridiculous expenses and half a million for Jamie doesn't really touch the sides and no. you'll know as well you've got other costs that's not one and a half million dollars she's sitting on in a little prize pot she's having to pay for travel she's <laughs> having to pay for staff she's having to pay for all this other stuff so yeah interesting I think we could uh, we could talk we could have a podcast separately for this to be honest I think Sophia and yeah. just talk about the pricing um but I mean but- in the end we all still love it you know and we keep yeah. on doing it and everyone is enjoying it and also myself you know yes I do want to go back to formulas but in the end I'm really happy with endurance um it's great cars it's great teams it's great people around there and we are still kind of um yeah happy with our lives you know and and that's the same for me but I think it's it's important to talk about numbers and to to talk to be open and to be honest because in tv at least in germany and if like watching f1 or so on weekends it's not really what people or what tv talks about and um yeah michael yeah uh one more for you so what do you miss most when you're not racing this is from <laughs> alex stanger alex stanger yeah I mean, I do think that nowadays you shouldn't say that anymore, but just the smell of fuel. <laughs> <laughs> you did some electric racing recently, didn't you? Electric testing. Yes, I did. And I, it's super cool. Like, really, I'm I'm really open-minded about all this, uh, like this whole topic. But yeah, the, the smell of fuel and like just the noise and the people. And it's it's really cool. Like, seriously, I think no one can really imagine, but like, apart from racing drivers, but if you're racing for a team for one whole season or even longer, maybe, it really kind of becomes your second family and all the people working there. I mean, you know, you're in the same hotels, you have breakfast together, you have lunch together, you have dinner together, and you're spending your whole day with the same people for many days a year. And it's just, it's just a vibe and it's just, it's just super cool. And that's also kind of what I love about the sport because it's not just about yourself, 
it's about all the te people being around you. And even if it's just the journalists, which are annoying to you again, because they ask you how the race was after crashing. <laughs> no, but, um, no, just, I mean, it's just, it's just a really, um, yeah, funny, funny world, to be honest. So if people are looking for Sophia and she's gone off the grid, just search for local petrol stations. You might be <laughs> sniffing all the fuel, right? <laughs> the very difficult question to end things on from CA pa CM Parfait 16, regular question asker. Hi, Sophia. Bread, any sort of bread, or pretzel, and why? <laughs> well, I would say pretzel as well. It's called pretzel in, in, in Germany, or in Bayern, at least, in Bavaria. Um, and just because I, I mean, I grew up in Munich. Um, I'm, I was born here. I grew up here, and you know, Brezen is just a really Bavarian type of thing. So, um, yeah, I would go for Brezen. Very. But, I mean, no one will know now what, but what I'm talking. But um, yeah. <laughs> Tra translate. What are you talking about? What does that mean? Uh, Obatsta is like. What is it actually? I think it's some kind of cream cheese, but a okay. lot more fat and like a lot more cal calories. So if you want on diet, don't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> there is this one final question from me, which may or may not make the final cut of the podcast, but you've now dealt with this annoying British guy for an hour or so. Am I more or less annoying than Piers Morgan, who you had to have an interview with, I saw after your crash, and he interrupted you incessantly. It was such a... I watched it and it, I was just annoyed. Just let us speak, let her answer the questions. But you've met Piers Morgan. What was that like? Well, uh, to be honest, good. I mean, uh, to be honest, after the crash, I mean, I had many a lot interviews. Of interviews. <laughs> yes, a lot of interviews. Um, but all of them, they were really respectful and um, it was all um yeah on a on a good level. And um, it was crazy to see how many people were actually interested in it and yeah, how many people kind of knew me after the crash. But um no, it was it was good and it was fun. And I mean, I actually flew to London, I think it mm -hmm. was, um, for the interview. And no, it was it was it was good. I actually, I mean, because I did Ginetta Juniors 2015. I kind of I loved England, and um, it was super funny because I raced the whole one whole year and I never had one rain day. So um, <laughs> yeah, it's it's crazy because everyone always says it's raining the whole time in England, but for me. I was there quite often. It never rained on when I was driving. So, um, no, I, I really like England and and London for, ex for especially. So, um, yeah, I always kind of have a connection there. Oh wow, that is well. Forget the Piers Morgan. That's a real bombshell here. If you want to go to England, Sophia, go when Sophia's there because no rain. That never happens. That's <laughs> that's a lottery sort of skill, lottery sort of luck that you've got there, Sophia. But I have to say that's all the time we have this week. Thank you, everybody. For watching and listening and thank you Sophia for being so open with all of your answers if you'd like to have your question asked on a future episode use the hashtag ask f1fs on twitter drop any questions below if you're watching on youtube you can respond to our instagram stories or posts or you can just let us know what questions you have on your mind on our discord look for the podcast questions channel and if you are watching on youtube dropping a like on the video leaving a comment and subscribing to the channel all really helps us out one day we may actually reach the heights of sophia's subscriber numbers on her youtube channel um if you are listening leaving a review on the podcast platform you're listening on is greatly appreciated finally check out f1feederseries.com for more feeder series insight and follow f1 feeder series one f1 fs live and as michael pointed out f1 fs americas on twitter for some reversing over the line action you can find the links to all of that, plus the Twitter accounts for myself and everyone else in the podcast. And let's be honest, you're already following Sophia Flush, so don't worry about that. But you can look for all that in the YouTube description or the podcast show notes. Until next time, we have been the F1 Feeder Series podcast. Goodbye. Cat, if you can see the cat. Hello. <laughs> um, excuse me, guys. That's not going to make the edit. Oh, shame. I'm sure we would have wanted to see the cat. Uh, yeah, well, maybe I'll put that in the uh, the post-credits bit, eh?